for setting up this session today. Thank you, Angus. Sorry, uh, got a bit rid of this thing. Move on. So I'm going to give a little introduction, and then in a way, that's a bit of a personal story uh, of the background uh, to this. My name is Patrick Corbett, and I'm one of the editors and your host this evening. Uh, I retired from in 2020 from Herrick Watt University as a professor of petroleum geoengineering after 40 years of working in professional geoscience in oil and gas. Little did I expect in those years that I would not be publishing a book of poetry. Uh, it all started with partial retirement. Uh, my longer term retirement project is to walk the length of the UT coastline with Kate. Uh, in random sections is dictated by availability of time and transport and weather, uh, and weather uh, friends and family. Um, and walking gives you a lot of time for quiet reflection and deep thought. Walking allows us to be in our bodies and in the world, said Solnit in 22. Uh, this is where my poetry comes from. Nan Shepherd said, I walk, therefore I am. So geoengineering, you know, that subject to me has always meant the seamless application of geoscience and engineering for the benefit, ideally, of humanity. Professional geoscientists and engineers face many cross-disciplinary challenges, communication being the, the strongest every day. But as geoscientists, we also face a challenge to improve communication with wider society. And this poetic medium has offered me potential new avenues in this respect. So could geopoetry be the bridge between geoscience and society? Uh, my father wrote poetry, and that must have been an influence probably long before geology cracked me. And after writing a few poems in retirement on geological themes, largely as I walked, inspired by the coastal scenery, it seemed logical to call it geopoetry. So inspired by Brian Lovell's earlier geology and poetry meeting 29, I set about organizing, sorry, 2011, I set about organizing another meeting, Geological Society meeting uh, in 2020, and I thought we'd call it geopoetry. So throwing this around, I came across, uh, so I was introduced to the Scottish Centre of Geopoetics uh, through my Harriet Watt colleagues, actually, through uh, Mary and, and, and Uri Koppel. And I attended their Wisdom Conference in 2019, and Norman Bissell and others were so uh, friendly and very keen to help with Geopoetry 2020. And around this time, Asif Khan, who's in the Scottish Poetry Library, asked me, what's the difference between Geopoetry and Geopoetics? And I said, good question, an idea. Uh, and this volume, which is essentially an edited compilation of everything that was presented in that conference, uh, and, and thanks to the sponsors, which we, we acknowledge there on the slide. Um, you know, it, it provides a resource for deeper consideration. You know, is there or isn't there a difference and does it matter? Uh, and we hope to learn something of that tonight. Uh, so to the book launch, and I only just realized in going through this that the cover that took the editor's note took a little bit of time to come up with an agreement. But it must have been Angus there because we've ended up with a picture which is the stack of Angus, thanks to David Gage. So, um, you know, stack of poems, uh, the stack of Angus, it seems very appropriate for a book published by the Edinburgh Geological Society, um, which Angus is a stalwart. Uh, so to the book launch and to this evening, this evening session will run, uh, we're going to have some readings and we've got two sequences of readings. Uh, sequence one, uh, and we're going to have a round table with some of the authors uh, that were involved in some of the essays. And then we're going to have some more poetry readings. And then Sarah is going to review our website, and give you some thoughts at some idea about the, the uh, unique volume, which has a website attached to it. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. And you can be sending those in by the chat uh, if, if you wish. Uh, and then we get to the acknowledgements. And here, alongside, I've used Rachel Tennant's uh, image, which which beautiful painting with poetry overlays. In the book, we tend to have to paint things separate from the poetry overlay. But, uh, you know, this was one of the things that would have looked beautiful if we could be there live instead of being online. Um, 
So uh, without any more ado, we'll go to that first sequence. Um, and uh, the sequence kicks off uh, with, with uh, poems and, and images. And I think um, all four of these poets, although uh, Jack, I'm not sure, uh, has turned up at the moment. But we'll start with Elizabeth. Thank you, Patrick. Um, before I start uh, reading my poem, I just want to give some context to the poem. Uh, so six million years ago, um, the connection between the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean was cut off. So um, the entire Mediterranean Sea just dried up like a deep pond underneath a hot sun. So my poem is imagining the Mediterranean Sea in the process of drying up, but as if it was happening today, um, right now. Uh, so here goes, um, in this brand new world, our feet pat by the skeletons of beach umbrellas, flared ragged curling in the hot sand. Melting plastic permeates the lining of our noses. Water drips onto the salt crusted sand cemented by gypsum plates and pearly calcite rims, percolating, leaking to the deep somewhere. Water abrades the canyon walls, falling into a sharp point, a V that cuts deeply through the tethys, lost oceans, lost seas. Water seeking that low, that last low flattening to where it evaporates into clouds that burn our souls. Once we could walk to the edge of the infinite, our Amai Gong Gong had said, we would not listen for we are young and we know everything. So to John, who was there. Um, so this is American Jihon. This is American geologist Florence Bascom describing her 19th century college experience. At university, they put me behind a screen for I was not to be seen by the studying men. Was this because I was such a blinding distraction or was I an unfortunate fact to be kept from the fiction of a superior fact-finding gender? Anyway, day in and out, I was put in doubt behind that screen, hidden, but not pretender. For whose discovery was it that local cycles of erosion were not the supposed two or three, but at least nine? Yes, it was mine, in spite of the persistence of those efforts to erode my existence. So unmute Lena. Sorry. Streams wet the dry land, wipe away the sand grains, then consign them to the ocean bed. There they lay all forgotten, piled up in murky water. A day soon will come if they don't get dispersed. A day of cementation, a day of consolidation, a day when they'll return into solid rock. A rock then might emerge, might emerge from the depth already, already to be exposed, all, all exposed in the air. The cycle then will continue, will turn it back into grains. The grains will be dispersed once more to be consolidated yet again, like the cycle. Of like the wig uh, to be consolidated yet again, like the vigorous cycle, the cycle of my vigorous dreams. Thank you. So I think that we've, um, we've, I think we've lost Jack. So what we'll do is we'll go on to the next uh, phase and then if Jack uh, no, no, Jack's here. You are there, Jack. Sorry. I'm very sorry about that, Jack. Too many people on the screens off you go, Jack.
Hi. Uh, sorry, should I start reading? Yeah, please do. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. So I wrote this for the Hugh Miller competition, which was inspired by the life and career of Hugh Miller, a geologist and a devout Christian. And he explored how the two informed each other in his book, The Testimony of the Rocks, which really spoke to me at the time as a lapsed uh, Catholic and as a scientist. So this is my poem. From a pew of sandstone and grey whack, I watched the tide fall from Sakar Point like a shallow breath from scarred lungs. Scotland, self-assembling cathedral, I love the rough-hewn altars you dragged out the seafloor. Like any man with an eye on the line and a smile caught on his mouth like a hook, the cliffs are at my back and eternity stretches ahead above, beneath. Today, I will worship whatever I find under the sky's soaring vault. I will sit with the stone and sand, listen to the waves and what little God I have left. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So uh, the next stage, we're going to have a little round table for uh, half an hour. Uh, and here we're going to, first of all, ask the uh, people who have written essays in this book. So this book has poems, and interspersed with that, it has essays. And I've asked each of the authors of those essays to just talk a little bit about their essay uh, as well as introduction. Uh, so picking off with, with Norrie Norman. Well, thank you, Patrick. It's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the Scottish Centre for Geopoetics. And um, I'd like to thank all those who read um, before me. Um, I think it would be good to, um, to respond to those poems. Uh, some of them, I would say, uh, were certainly good examples uh, of geopoetry. I just want to outline briefly some of the differences between geopoetry and geopoetics, uh, as I have done in the, in the essay in the book. Uh, geo, geo poetry is the expression of the earth and its geology and the work of geologists in poems, in poetry. And uh, the, whereas geopoetics includes geopoetry, but is a wider concept and way of perceiving the world. Uh, it, it, includes uh, poems about geology, but it goes deeper and in wider uh, in, in its approach to, to the earth. It certainly puts the earth at the center of our experience and emphasizes the importance of our relationship with the earth. But it's the creative, geopoetics is the creative expression of the earth and our relationship as human beings to the earth. In, in a whole variety of ways, in the arts, in sciences, in, uh, in the thinking, and in combinations and collaborations of all of these things. Uh, and it's, it sees humans as part of the natural world and seeks to overcome the our alienation and separation that humans have created uh, in separating themselves from the rest of the natural world. As I said, it's also a way of perceiving the world um, with all our senses and our knowledge, applying our knowledge and study of the earth in, uh, in our approach to it. And it can be a very, very uh, creative and productive approach as, as uh, poets and as writers and as artists and scientists and thinkers of all kinds. If I can just find it for a moment, this, this particular poem uh, is called When You Go Out, and it's really a way of trying to express that idea that um, you, we are perceiving the world is of great significance. Um, yeah, I'll try and remember, oh yeah, here we are. Try and remember it, but it's called When You Go Out. 
when you go out into the world, try to use all your senses. Touch and taste wild thyme. Smell hawthorn and kelp. Watch herring gulls soar. Listen to the sound of the sea. Above all, open your mind and who knows what you will find. So that's about perceiving the world from a geopoetic standpoint. I would say finally that Geopoetics is an international movement. Uh, it was founded by the Scottish poet who's lived in France most of his life, Kenneth White. Uh, and it's, he founded the International Institute of Geopoetics in 1989. The Scottish Centre for Geopoetics was founded in 1995 by Tony McManus, myself and others. And it, um, it's an active international movement which seeks to bring about radical cultural renewal. And perhaps we could discuss what, uh, if we have time for discussion at the end, what that involves. Uh, for, we, we publish various books. So if you join the Scottish Centre for Geopoetics, you get a free copy of Grounding a World. I'm missing all that. Uh, essays on the work of Kenneth White. And we also have an annual journal. In fact, this year, we're going to have uh, two issues of it. We brought out um, one every year for the last nine issues. And this year, we're hoping in November to bring out issue 10, because we had so much good work came in uh, earlier in the year that we have two uh, issues of it from that. So that's a brief introduction to what geopoetics is about. And uh, I hope that helps to clarify the difference between geopoetics and geopoetry. Thank you for listening. Yeah, and Norman has an essay on that in, in the book. Um, so, uh, and the next person here on the table is Yvonne. So Yvonne, you would like to talk a little bit about your essay. Sure. Well, my essay about the voices from rock um, was one that I hugely, hugely enjoyed writing. Um, it enables me to sort of meander through uh, a bit of nature writing and, um, and pretend I'm Kathleen Jamie for the day. And it all arose from a really, really enjoyable walk on Arthur's seat that we were able to do in spite of the pandemic. We, we had a few people there and we were all socially distanced and we were all outdoors. Um, and we went up this, this wonderful, wonderful landscape that's just redolent of, of volcanism um, and a, a very kind of dramatic history and at, at intervals we were pausing to read poems so my essay is designed for people to be able to follow that route if they want to as well um, but you've you've asked me to come prepared with a couple of uh, a couple of things pat and i wanted to highlight how much i enjoyed working across disciplines for this i think the idea of keeping the geo and the poetic separate, which a, a lot of universities might encourage us to do. I think, I think that's not really productive. I think we are at our strongest and, and richest and most um, fascinated by each other's work and by ideas when we collaborate. It's a huge pleasure to work across disciplines. I really, really enjoy it. And actually, this whole volume and this whole process of collaborating has brought home to me the strength of working collectively. It's made me think very in great depth about how creative outputs um, like anthologies and like this essay collection actually come about, the role of different people, the role of different disciplines. Um, and I've actually just put in a funding bid to focus on collaborative works that arise because of people's uh, work as collectives across sciences, arts, writing, um, on climate change specifically. So I'm very, very happy to come back to my essay in a moment, but I know we, we need to hear from John. I've had the pleasure of receiving poems from both Pat and John for Magma Poetry Magazine and we're publishing them, so thank you both. Um, this collaboration has seeded 
all manner of wonderful, wonderful things. So I'm thankful to have been working with you. Thank you. There you are, John, that's your intro. It was a pleasure um, with, with everyone. And again, yeah, thank you to the editorial board for, for pulling this together and pulling this off in, in, in such a short time scale. It's a magnificent piece of work, I think. And great, the poems. The create poems embed exactly that sort of interdisciplinarity that Yvonne was referring to. Um, I was asked to, to write a, an essay which was essentially um, the poetics of climate change, um, jumping the rails, and I suppose it sat within uh, debates that were happening a year ago um, around what was effective climate change poetry, certainly within the Scottish po um, poetry community. Um, and the question of whether asking a poet, I won't particularly picture, pick on someone like Karen Van Duffy, but let's say Karen Van Duffy, to write a climate change poem when they're not necessarily, when they are well-known poets and therefore attract attention and readership, but actually not necessarily embedded in the, the science and the experience of climate change. Um, and I think the whole as it says at the beginning of the essay, to some extent, the Anthropocene is a fundamental paradigmatic shift, I think, in human relationships to the world, to Earth, as Nori would put it. Um, it's like Einstein, it's, you know, it is, a, it is a fundamental, oh, there's not humanity and nature, there's just one big geological process. And just at the minute, um, we are driving it faster than plate tectonics or um, asteroid behaviour or solar flares. Um, we, are, we are that geological process at the moment and we need to acknowledge both the physics of that and the fact that as sentient beings, um, we are the ones who feel the Anthropocene. Other things might die of the Anthropocene, but in a sense we are both responsible and able to do something about it. Um, and in that sense, um, I think there's a real challenge to say, how do we, through collaboration, ideally, educate the poets and also uh, break um, science or engineering away from diplomatic language? Um, you know, they've gone a lot further in AR6 than they had before, but I, the AR6 is still diplomatic language um, in terms of its ignoring of certain big tipping points. Um, so it, it feels as though actually in the course of the year um, my practice but also the whole conversation has shifted on dramatically um, I'm very involved just now in a set of community consultations in the northeast uh, to roll something through into COP26 because um, some people have got space in the green zone and what comes out is, a, is the importance of a community story about, about climate change um, you know up here where I'm living in, in, in Aberdeenshire and in Mar, it's heavily invested in meat production. Um, there needs to be a community narrative in that. And so again, a, an interdisciplinary discussion between mob grazing, its ability to impact the climate and the economic impact of that on farmers is, is kind of the stuff of poetry that, that there needs to be an informed debate, which at the same time, um, has the stickiness and the imagination and the music of something like poetry, and to some extent prose, but certainly poetry, to, to bring it alive for communities, both local, regional and, and national and global. Um, so it feels like there's a, um, and I think I'm trying to say that in this, there, there's, a, there's an important mix of craft, strategy and intellectual rigor in this, which has to be a collaborative project. Um, you know, uh, I'm lucky in the sense that, like Patrick, I've got about 30 years background in the oil and gas industry um, and was originally trained as a chemist. Um, so in a sense, the science is, is, I'm not an expert in it, but the science is accessible to me. Um, and it's only by breaking down the barriers and making science and imagination um, mutually accessible in this area that I think we can get an effective um, and inspiring, which is what it has to be, um, climate change poetry. So, and yeah, this has been great, but there's so much that's coming out of it and there's so much more work to do. 
especially after November. It'll be grim. <laughs> I mean, we need to be writing about tipping points now. We not we need not to be writing about the fact that it rained again. We need to be talking about the fact that um, hydrates from the East, East Siberian seabed are about to flare off in a big way and what that might mean. Um, and that's a kind of, that's a whole new challenge, I think, um, compared to how does it feel in Surbiton? Thank you. Thank you, John. So that's next on to, to Brian. So you have the floor. Brian. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, I came into poetry, as I suppose many people did, through school. But being the possessor of a very short term memory, being able to recite poems by heart was, um, shall we say, an extreme problem uh, and almost destroyed the brilliance of, of poetry for me. I was originally going to become a biochemist, but my short term memory didn't allow me to deliver all sorts of things that were required for, say, A level. But uh, being an outdoor type and mountaineering and so on, I became more and more interested in geology. And uh, I eventually did physical geography and geology, partly this is a, one of these peculiarities of the British educational system that uh, geologists don't do any geomorphology, but most um, geologists don't really know enough geomorphology when they should, but that, that's an entirely separate area. But I came into poetry from the point of view of uh, the scientist Viroslav Holub. And when I was at Queen's University Belfast, um, so Holub came over a couple of times and uh, I was very taken by him uh, as a person, as a scientist uh, and, and as a poet. And I think he remains one of the few proper scientist stroke poets. Uh, and I also became interested in people like George Mackay Brown and in particular Edwin Morgan. And one of my prized possessions is a, is a collective poems of Edwin Morgan. It was when I was visiting a friend of mine uh, who taught at the high school of, uh, of Glasgow uh, and was an old student of mine. And his wife, Jennifer, who was in English said, oh, Edward Morgan's talking down at the high school this evening. So actually, as it happened, I'd only recently bought a collected poems. I went down there and I have my collected poems uh, signed by Edward Morgan. And the first macker, I think, is for me a very good geological poet. I'm not going to go into that any more detail, but I think he epitomizes geology, Scottishness, uh, and uh, an innate sense of language in a variety of, of different ways. And what I've been putting together in, in this chapter is trying to look at a sort of historical view of geological or time-related poetry together. And by virtue of taking field trips to Cumbria, in particular South Cumbria, I became aware, quite belatedly in, in fact, of, of the poetry of Norman Nicholson. And I realized that not only was Nicholson a very astute observer of the landscape, which at that time was a very parochial thing. And in, in fact, he's been decried as a, a parochial and, and somewhat um, religious type of poetry, which at that time, that's the time of, um, oh, uh, people like um, Ted Hughes and that um, peculiar poet of the East Coast who wrote Wits and Weddings. Um, he was really almost disparaged. But by going to places like Milham, which is singularly unfashionable, but yet the whole of Milham depends upon its geology from the mining of the hematite there. And I became aware of Norman Nicholson's uh, poetry, so much so that I'm, I'm now uh, membership secretary of the Norman Nicholson Society. But long before that, I looked at his poetry. And for instance, it, for me, he became the geological poet 
And if I can write, read to you a few extracts from his poem called Beck. The water abrades, erodes, dissolves, limestones and chlorides, organizes it haulage, every drop loaded with a millionth of a milligram of fell. And if that's not a geological poem, I really don't know what is. So the students looked at me somewhat peculiarly, I think, when I sat on the lecture bench and read that to them and said, well, okay, let, let's have a look at this. And what Nicholson has done, not just in Beck, but in a whole variety of his poems, is to look at the geology of, in particular, South Cumbria that was around and about him and described it in poetry. And one of the things that scientists like to do is, okay, reductionism is not the flavour of the year, as it were, but nevertheless, scientists actually want to try and encapsulate what's going on in the minimum possible of words or pictures. And for me, Nicholson does that in poetry. And one of the things that writing poetry actually does is makes you concentrate things. Um, unlike, and I hesitate to say, the verbosity of William Wordsworth, but of course he was living in a different age and he, he is considered to be the Lakeland poet. But in many respects, Norman Nicholson, who lived in Milham for virtually all of his life, though he traveled to Norway and all sorts of places, geological places, I should add, nevertheless um, epitomizes the local scenery, not just in the geology, but what the geology becomes to mean for Milham, the ironworks, the closing down of the ironworks, uh, Hodborough mines, uh, and I don't think, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that any other poet has entitled a poem called The Borehole. Uh, and Pat may like to correct me on that, but whereas Nicholson looks at the borehole from a poetic point of view, but encapsulates basically what's going on when you drive a borehole down and look at, look at the log. Um, the other thing that Norman Nicholson does, and I, I think it's uh, going to the wider Lakeland, is look at the basic, what he calls the seven rocks of, of Lakeland. And he refers back to Jonathan Otley and the origins of geology within, within Cumbria. And I think that's very much to, to his credit. So as part of the society, we're trying to promote not only Nicholson the poet, but the repurchase of his house, uh, but also extemporize and promote his geological and natural history, as, as well as his local presence in the, in the community. Right, can I, can uh, and I'm pleased to say that I think uh, my son yeah. Harry is somewhere yeah. online, uh, and Harry wrote a piece for String Quartet called The Seven Rocks. Uh, and again, that comes back to the seven rocks that are predominantly within Cumbrian uh, landscape. Uh, and bring together what Norman Nicholson means to me. But he's a Northern poet, he's an outlier. He's an outlier in the sense that uh, George Mackay Brown is, and to a certain sense, Edward Morgan. Um, and one might also mention uh, W.H. Auden, but we're, I think Pat's going to talk about that later on. So Norman Nicholson is very much a geologist poet. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'm Brian. Well, because because uh, Rob there has, Rob there has, has a, a very line uh, relationship with this local area. So Rob, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, just so first of all, just a pleasure to be here and thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, so my name's Rob Francis. I'm uh, one of the lecturers in creative and professional writing at the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, and uh, over the last sort of 18 months, I've had the great, great pleasure of being the poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society, um, exploring uh, poetically and physically the, uh, the now UNESCO recognized Black Country Geopark. Um, and my essay in part deals with some of those explorations, um, but focuses mainly on the field of environmental psychology and the notion of place identity that was played out by Harold Prashansky. Uh, place identity is a term used to kind of think about the way in which 
we as individuals and as communities uh, bring place into our sense of self. And if you think about place as a sort of dynamic arena where memories and families and people and smells and sites and historic buildings and art and culture and uh, all of those great lovely things sort of swirl about and run in their own currents. Uh, and, and it's through our, navigo our navigation of those things that we, we start to see our, ourselves and identify with our places and our locales. Um, but of course, much of that would be uh, in, a, in a black hole or in a void if it wasn't for the geology that underpins all of that. Uh, this is particularly pertinent to, to my region, the black country. Uh, that was known for its role in the industrial uh, industrial revolution. It was called the cradle of the industrial revolution. Um, but if it wasn't for the, the limestone rich and, and uh, uh, rocks uh, and, and the, the coal steam, uh, none of that would have taken place. And so you wouldn't have had the same housing estates and uh, working men's clubs and uh, all of the, the things that kind of spiral out of that industry as well. Um, the, the, the second part of my essay, so my essay kind of uh, explores the, the, the idea that geology is the, the bedrock, uh, pardon the pun, of, uh, of our place identity, of our sense of self within a landscape. Geology underpins all of that. Uh, the, the, the second part of my essay, I suppose, looks at the effects of geopoetry and, and, or geopoetics uh, as a way of kind of coming to terms and understanding and reconfiguring our sense of self within a landscape through uh, uh, what Nori said really in, in his opening statements about using the senses, about bringing together uh, our instinctual and imaginative sides of our minds with our cognitive abilities. Um, and it, uh, it was a, a joy to be part of this project and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the book. Thank you, Rob. Um, this was meant to be a round table discussion, but it's been a table round of discussion um, rather than round and round. So we've, we've got a few minutes left and so I'm going to jump to the questions that, uh, you know, how, how does this inspire you to do something differently from, from, from when we approached geopoetry, you know, not really knowing what geopoetry event was going to be like and who you're going to meet and what you're going to say. So how would you do something differently? And I'm thinking in terms of if we ran another event, you know, um, along these lines, along these earth lines, what, what would you do differently? And, and whoever wants to go in first can go in first. Well, I might jump in there, actually, then, uh, Patrick, if that's OK. Um, I, I wonder whether um, some kind of uh, practical uh, stuff around uh, geopoetic practices uh, would be where I would run to. Um, one of the things that has sort of uh, really shaken me in lots of ways and, and in, a, in, an, in a beautiful way is the, my sense of self as a, as a mammal, as a, as a being, as an animal, um, kind of as I navigate the grounds with that kind of geopoetic lens on everything that I do. Uh, and, and that's really led me down some really interesting avenues in terms of uh, using different breathing techniques, different uh, mindfulness um, practices, um, and sort of different ways of navigating and walking and and, uh, uh, and getting getting up close and dirty with our terrains. So I, I think yeah, that's the, the idea of the uh, the walk that we were planning to do around you. Mm. Yeah, was definitely the idea. I think myself as a slug more than a mammal, but there you are. Um, did somebody else want to come in on this? Yeah, I I, I would agree with Rob on, on, on that point. I, I think if we um a walk would be a great a great approach as we had originally planned, um up Arthur's seat or wherever. But also I think um workshops, I think the concepts of, of geopoetry and geopoetics are out there now. And the book, I think, will, will deepen an understanding of that. Uh, so I think we then need to move to the next stage, which is to encourage and 
en enable folk to, to begin to practice geopoetry and geopoetics. And some, some of the most successful things that we've done in the conferences that we've had every two years as the Scottish Centre for Geopoetics have been the workshops uh, which have attracted uh, various folk from either visual arts or poets or um, prose writers uh, or musicians or people into creative ethnology and beginning to apply um, uh, the, the, the creative expression of the earth to their particular interests. So I think that would be a fruitful way forward if we were doing, to do this again, Pat. Okay, and, and John and Yvonne have got a couple of comments. John? Uh, yeah, I think we're all sort of violently in agreement. I think the pra you know, experiential practicality and workshopping and getting people engaged um, would be an, you know would be an important thing to do if we could do this all in real life um, rather than online. Um, the other thing I think we, we've learned from this exercise is the is the kind of interdisciplinary connections that we've created through through from the date of the first of October 2020 onwards, if you see what I mean. Um, and that an approach rather than individuals pitching individually. Um, to yes, I would like to present a poem or I would like to present a, a presentation um, would be almost to pair people up beforehand. So yes, expressions of interest, but it might be quite interesting to say, if you want to play, you have to find a partner. <laughs> I don't know how exactly we enable that, but I think there's something about saying, um, setting up the kind of um, dating agency beforehand and using that to design events, um, given that we've now got a community. Speed dating for poets and geologists. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Different sides of the table. Is that your idea as well, or you got something? <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, just to echo Rob and uh, John and everything they've been saying about going out for a walk. Fantastic. I think that would be absolutely brilliant. Something I was going to ask you, Pat, is if you could bring your enviable rock and fossil collection for a writing workshop. I love writing workshops. I run them for part of my job. Um, Rob will too, and many others here do. Uh, there is no greater pleasure than actually physically touching and experiencing a really, really fascinating object. Um, if the trilobites are too precious, don't worry, we can just look at them. But you know, an exercise where you go out for a walk and you, you bring back a rock specimen, it doesn't have to be a special one, um, or you bring back a pebble from the shore, I think would be absolutely fantastic. Very, very simple, but very good at getting people engaged and, and getting them actually writing. Um, another thing is that Magma absolutely loves organising collaborations like this. They did some climate change sort of speed dating things where they did actually do pairings. And I, I've done something similar before for a previous issue. Um, so yeah, by all means, get them involved. Cheryl and Maya really enjoyed meeting uh, you, Pat, and, and John Bolland as well. Um, so please ask them again, it would be fun. Okay, my, my poet friend, Ruth Aylert, who some people might know, she turned up today for coffee with, with, a, with a nodule of iron. She thought it was a cannonball. She thought it was an iron cannonball that she'd found in her allotment. And I said, no, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a silver nodule from the ironstone in the Carboniferous. And so, um, but it was an inspiring object. And I, I told her to go away and write a poem, or I suggested she might write a poem. Um, any, any other comments there? I mean, I, I think, as Yvonne alluded to, and, and as we said, Geopoetry 2020 did plan to have workshops and did plan to do some of this stuff. But, you know, are we going to have a five-day event or are we going to have a sort of half-an-hour event? I mean, I suspect it's going to be longer uh, than, than one day next time. I think that's something that is going to happen. We're going to have longer than... Originally, Geo Poetry 2020 was going to be one day, um, and we were going to try and cram a walk and a workshop and readings. But I think we have such a wealth of interest and, and things here. But, uh, uh, as Norm says, the Centre of Geopoetics in Scotland has two or three day meetings, and so they work quite well. So maybe that's something for the future, but I'm not volunteering. Mm -hmm. Yes, so somebody's yep. saying looking forward to Poetry 2022, uh, and somebody already asked me if they could submit, and I said, this is not an annual meeting. The last one was nine years ago, so, uh, but it may not be nine years into the future. 
Can I just chip Sorry, in, Brian? Patrick? Yeah, chip in, Brian. Um, one of the things, uh, and Yvonne's already mentioned this, and also related to the things that John's been saying, and I was very impressed with his, uh, his essay, is that there tends to be this distinction and it comes all the way through the educational system of STEM and others. In other words, if you're a quote, scientist, mathematician, you're in. And if you're an arts person, and perhaps social scientist, then, then you're not. And I think that that's very detrimental to, to general education, not because looking at these things is are, are important things in their own right, in, in terms of creativeness, the creativeness of a musician or an artist, whether they happen to be working in plastic arts or in two dimensional sketching and all the, all the rest of it. These are fundamentally part of looking and observing. And I've always appreciated what Maggie Hamlin has said is that she always starts off by sketching. She's a plastic artist, but she starts off by sketching. And, and I've written something about sketching and geology and geomorphology. And that's the sort of thing that, oh no, it does, you can take a photograph. Well, yes, you can take a photograph, but what do you actually mean by that? And there are all sorts of things in terms of how we observe, how we are interpret. And some of those things come from hard sciences, some come from geology, some come from all sorts of social aspects. And the important thing to get youth, if I may use that, sort of, not, not in a pejorative sense, but general sense, is to look at the world as it is and to try and understand it from all sorts of different points of view. And I think geology actually is a good way of doing that because it brings in things like poetry, as we're demonstrating here, but but also in terms of landscape uh, artists and and hard sciences. I think, and we, I think we we, on this call, Ed, Brian, Brian, on this call, I think we'd all agree with that. You know, I think we would all thoroughly agree with that. I'm going to have to move on because we've got a line of people to read poems. And John, unless you've got a very quick point, I'm going to move on. You, you're okay with that because you've got your hand up still. So okay. Uh, so in our next sequence, uh, we're going to introduce some new voices uh, and, and some young voices. Um, hopefully they're out there. Uh, so we're going to uh, start off with Stuart. Hello, Patrick. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here again. Old Boy. So Old Boy is the name that's given by the 19th century survey geologist to Delessia Nice. And Delessia Nice occurs in the northwest of Scotland and it's amongst the oldest rocks in Europe. And this poem is my tribute both to the Lycian Nice but also to those early geologists. Old boy. Older than life, the ancient dark whale of Europe surfaces. His back just visible. Many have tried to remold him. We work him. All have failed. Time means nothing to him. He has it on his side. He absorbs all comers, right or meteorite. All get treated with the same indifference. You are the foundation on which great things are. Sliced and spliced. And stack. Still the same expression, the sheer doubt, head pan, just nothing away. Peach, corn, and cloth, tough and good. Unraveled your mysteries, old boy, gave you your name. Okay. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Killard Point is a most beautiful place in 
County Down in Northern Ireland, where I love to walk. I'm going there this weekend. Uh, so this is called Killard Point. Before Vikings, St. Patrick and the early settlers at Killard Point, an ice age founded on a coast once again revealed its flesh stripped ribs striated a landscape scoured by forces hard to fathom. Some speak of kilometers, others miles of ice that passed over these rock surfaces with cargo of boulders, cobbles and pebbles swept from Scotland and the Ailsa Craig. Erratics that rest where farmers steer the plow, where whooper swans and Brent geese graze stranded on storm beaches where painted ladies bask in warm autumnal sun. Thank you. Good evening. Time tide. Time tied in tangle and twiggery, bound to one story of a random moment, frozen for empty eons to no witness. A deep memory in a silent library of strata, until chance and torture reveals in a mist wrapped dawn on crashing coast or endless peak, the drama of that captured scene and it's gone, lost to time. Good evening, does it work my microphone? Good. Okay, just very quickly, um, these are part of a collection of geo haikus uh, by which I wanted to capture the cycle of sediment from its birth to its death and again rebirth. Drop by drop, rain falls, herald of change and motion. Sediment is born. Calcareous plant, white leaf petrified in time, murmur of water. Silent clay settles, a calm, deep destination, end and beginning. So, uh, okay, so the next piece is to hand over to Sarah, who's going to take us through the online uh, accompaniment to our volume. Sarah, it's over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm um... I'm slightly different to a lot of people here because I'm a, a poet and poetry filmmaker. Um, and I'm very pleased to present um, the Earthlines um, online site uh, as part of the, on the Edinburgh Geological Society website, <clears throat> hosted so well by Angus. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm here really to present that and to talk a little bit more about the films that are on there and myself and my role. Um, uh, so um, here is the page that you'll see when you go onto the site. Um, uh, and after I've done this, actually, just to say that um, Ken Coburn's film will be played. So you will see one of the films from the site. Um, uh, next slide, please, Patrick. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a, a poetry filmmaker. This is a still from my film Firewash. Um, and I, I'm part of this because I made, um, I have developed a project on family history poetry films. And my, um, done a lot of research on my own ancestors. And I go to sites um, where they have lived. And it turned out that quite a number of mine were minors. And this is from a site I went to stay at. Um, and made a film about and wrote a poem about. 
and it's called Firewash, and it's about manganese, in fact, a, a site where there's manganese. So um, although I'm not a geologist or, or uh, I don't have that kind of a knowledge, um, for me, the, um, it's a very important subject in terms of place, as Rob was saying, <clears throat> and family um, and environment, um, and central to my work and my practice. Um, so yes, yeah, so poetry films are short, just to like, just to give an idea, per, um, I've written a book on poetry film called The Poetics of Poetry Film, which is actually publicized behind me. Um, and it took five years to write, but uh, because there are many types of poetry film. And um, so mainly they consist of where there's poetry, uh, either verbal or visual or both on screen with the moving image and soundscape. Um, and so, and some of these were different, were very interesting because they were different versions of that, either playing on, on still, still photography and having uh, that combined with uh, soundscape or maybe um, the moving image um, and, and still photography. So there were, there were some, some very interesting interpretations that came out of geopoetry itself um, in the moving image. Um, so, um, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, yes, this is where you'll see, uh, these are the people who um, are on the site so far, and some of whom, well, I think maybe most, most people probably are here today, I'm not sure. Um, and also there's a very interesting um, factor to this. Um, in fact, the poetry film side of it is, was my suggestion, but also to have a geolocation um, aspect to the site, which means that you can not only, you know, you can start from the inspiration of the, of the rock on the ground or the mountain, uh, which becomes onto the page, and then it moves onto the screen. And then finally, again, you can take a look at the planet from above and see where all the little poems uh, are coming from. So it makes a great collaborative uh, image and uh, a nice a nice sort of a community <clears throat> of people on the planet um, uh, yeah and so and also you could actually be looking at one of those sites you could be looking at one of the films on your phone as well at the same time so we're living in a very techno technological society um, yes so um, what was I going to say next I think we'll move on to slide the next slide please Pat and um, we this is um so Andrews, um, um, in this case, uh, geological time is condensed in his film Zircon, which I understand, and for the non-geologists, um, that grains of this mineral, mineral have been found that nearly as old as the world itself. So to, his poem though is very, with taking that into consideration, consideration it's a very condensed and short poem which really uh, conveys that um, topic of deep time if you like and many of the films um, I would say it's interesting because poetry film is a um, uh, is a medium where sequence and time are constantly being explored and with layers layers of of time looking back into the past the past and the present um, the way that poets do on the page, but it can be in the moving image, it can be very, very um, effective. And of course, this correlates nicely with uh, uh, geo poetry. Um, uh, so um, that's something again to think about the relationship of time to these films. And this is particularly as well in Sarah Acton's um, lovely Earth Shapers poetry cycle, which takes you through. Um, I think stratigraphic uh, series of, of uh, uh, number um, uh, uh, stanzas, which take you through his, the historic history of the of the Jurassic Coast, um, and it's fascinating. And the film itself actually focuses for quite some time because the language is so crafted. Um, and interesting that the actual visuals are quite simple in black and white and quite, for quite a long time you focus on the birds and the tree, which has a very sort of timeless and slightly eerie um, uh, 
feel to it. And then, and then again, in the next, from that on, we even just have a, a blank screen for a short while. So I think she's been incredibly creative with this film. And, um, and this is what can happen when you just literally take hold of a camera and, or um, get, get working with video. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yes, yeah, so Brian Rosen um, uh, has created a series of stills over a 10 minute um, time frame, which uh, uh, are they, they, um, they have a refrain so that it comes back to a sort of chorus and as a ballad might. And you are that, in, in that way, it conveys a sense of, things repeating across this landscape and the mining, the industrial heritage. Um, many of the films are about industrial heritage, people in the landscape, what's happening to, to the landscape where humans have got involved with the, with the stone and the rocks and what, what have they done with them? And here we've got the mining. Um, uh, and um, so similarly uh, with Poco Swedges, <clears throat> excuse me, folk, folk song, that uh, has, set, that's, again, that's mining at the center of that. And uh, Elsie Ma Marley drowned in the ochre water. Uh, so that they're, they're singing about Elsie Marley and uh, uh, it's effectively, this, this is a, re a repeating refrain often that the mining is coming into the topic just as it is in my film with my, with my family history. So the next slide is um, this beautiful uh, watercolour um, by Rachel Tennant, and she's managed to combine stills, watercolour stills, which is very interesting in itself, with the text and her voiceover. And I think it's an incredibly effective way of, of doing that. Um, uh, and there are three, there's a, it's a series of um, her Orkney stories and um, she's a landscape architect, so you, you, not only that, and a poet as well, of course, so the, 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 these things are all resonating in her imagery, and she says she's distilling a physical and emotional response that renders the spirit of place, and I think she really, really achieves that, and um, I haven't been, well, actually I actually have been to Orkney, but some of these, not all of these places that she's mentioning, and we're talking about, again, a moment in time. She wants to capture a moment in time, but that's set against maybe some uh, a place that was inhabited in the Neolithic period. So you've got these amazing sweeps of time going on uh, in, a single, in a single image. Uh, next slide, please. So this is Yvonne at Arthur's seat. And uh, uh, again, um, here you, um, in a way time collapses again because um, one poet recalling another poet from history, re-speaking re, re their words, re-voicing them um, in the same place, talking about, uh, you know, the city noise, uh, different city noise, same, uh, you know, but the same um, moment in time, really. Uh, and that in itself has a wonderful um, resonance. Um, and again, with Pat, this is why I put them together, we're having the, the imprints made by the dinosaurs, which I just can't really fathom to get my head around, to be honest. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, and, uh, and again, that's contrasted uh, with, he's using still and moving images in, in this, but he was, he's talking about quarrying, uh, a man removing stuff from the ground. But as that's happening, um, these, these, in contrast, the dinosaur footprints are there pretty much forever, as long as we can call forever. And so um, the, also the, um, the, the, the stories inside the Dorset pub, again, those are preserved. So it's about preservation through the, through the rock, that particular poem in Bare Bones. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're on to climate change. And of course, Philip Ringrose's um, extraordinary, very simple film really, but gosh, it conveys 
and, and taking another approach is just to, to um, show how much the, the world really means to him and to his family in a sense, in a very simple uh, film on a Norwegian fjord, this is filmed. So it's a very pure landscape, but he's talking about the fragile membrane of this, of this bubble, which am I, one of the, the younger people blew this bubble and it floats around the landscape and you, you, you get the feeling that, that this, yes, he's talking about bi, birefringent prismatic shimmer, for example. So you've got the scientific language um, with a sense of uh, how we must treasure the planet. Um, so that's an unusual um, way of looking at, uh, looking at uh, the eco problem we've got at the moment. Um, and on the other hand, in the next slide, we have um, John's um, film, uh, which is a Vatic, a Vatic um, takes a Vatic approach to the climate emergency and is incredibly powerful in, in, a, in a completely different way um, and really makes you think on this particular slide. I just um, uh, cannot, you know, when you, you have to take on board this kinds of facts in a poem is quite, I think is a very new and innovative way of approaching um, the topic. Um, so here, within this are geocouplets, what he calls geocouplets, which again, using scientific language, um, uh, as you can just see now. Um, and so it's, a, it's really a composition. This piece, um, his work is a composition of different movements is what I really felt. And uh, they, they develop. And he says, I'm watching the forecast faced with disaster after disaster. And the other images, of course, um, uh, sh uh, show us where we are now on the planet as we are consumers. Um, can we do something? And that's the big question. Um, and then the final, my final slide is Ken's Close, which um, at first glance, you might think, gosh, this is a very simple simple poem and, and film, but gosh, I began to realize how layered it is. And um, sort of an oscillating pattern of, te of tempor temporal and spatial and linguistic dualities. So he, he um, in 1996, I think it was, yes, he was at this exact same spot with his four-year-old daughter. And a moment was caught in time where he saw her, uh, they were waiting for a bus and he saw her um, and a poem, I suppose, came straight to him, a bit like, um, on, you know, uh, in a station of the Metro. Um, and that moment was fused into this poem. Um, and he talks, in the poem, it talks about the, the past and the present are contrasted, the past ghosts and fanatics of now, newspapermen who are fanatics of now, and <clears throat> airy bridges marry, marry with rock. <clears throat> And he uses uh, the contact line and the junction of old and new, and it's all really about the relationship to his, to his daughter and the and the place, um, and of course being close, as well. So, um, and a, uh, so the film sort of doubles all that because he's back there, but not with his daughter, and yet still, um, we see that 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 moment is. You can almost see that moment as a viewer, again, as he recites the poem. So I find that a very potent potent little film. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think those are some examples of, of uh, video of poetry films or video poems or audiovisual work on the site. And I hope that it will grow and continue. Um, and so now I'm going to hand you back to Pat um, and we're going to see the film, uh, uh, Ken's film. Thank you very much. So now that we're on the site, and we're in uh, Ken's section, so you have another little biography there. Um, and then uh, here we have uh, Ken's poem, and it starts in silence, so don't think you've uh, lost the sound. It starts very silently. Close. 
The bus is due all right, but keeps us waiting. The utter narrowness of flesh market close slopes away behind us. The ghosts of butchers faint amid newspaper men, fanatics of now. My daughter races down it. At the foot, a silhouette against the buzz and flicker of the street. She lingers for a moment. A single step could snap this contact line. She shouts I'm not to move and runs towards me. Then soon the bus arrives. We move across the junction of the old and new towns where the airy bridges touch the high street rock. Okay, so now's uh, your chance to uh, to sort of fire in some questions, and you can do that uh, through uh, some nice comments coming back on the chat. Um, if you're looking at the chat, you can either put some questions in there, or uh, if um, Angus switches on your mic, you might be able to speak. Uh, but uh, that, this is the time for some questions to the audience. You'll see that that's Ken Coburn uh, standing. Uh, on, on the hillside of, of Arthur C. Uh, with, with uh, Yvonne from an earlier poetry walk that we did, which gave us inspiration for taking a poetry walk up over Arthur C. So, um, any questions? And that's uh, Andrew. Uh, you can come in from the cold, Andrew. Andrew's uh, boots there. Andrew has. <laughs> Andrew has a lovely poem, which is um, which is uh, uh, about geologist boots. I never thought that, you know, having got through many pairs of geologist boots myself, uh, that one would be so uh, in, enamoured by one's boots. But there you are, there's uh, Andrew's boots, presumably somewhere in Canada. Um, so do we have any uh, um, comments? Uh, if you have no questions, you have comments. Uh, you can put a poem in the chat if you wish. Um, some of the people who have already spoken may want to come back and, and, and add some comments to that. Or if we just stunned you with silence. It's sort of like teaching online these days. You know, you, you stand there, you give a lecture, and then you say, right, students, are you awake? You know. You Patrick, around. could I say about the, the, the joining in of the, 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 the pairing up of poets and geologists? Absolutely, John. It's a, it's a marvelous idea and um, we can be sure, well obviously we will learn a lot about geology and I, I would hope that we can show something about wordplay um, and play and I just thought well, as we were talking I was thinking of play because I did this with, with the drawing that we had with uh, Florence Bascom um, I did a caption contest in Bristol for her and so there she is with the, the rhyolite and there's the dog with the obsidian. And um, the, I had to just get, handed this out to people. And the, the, the caption that won was uh, very good, but can you fetch this one? Uh, Florence Bascom is saying there. And I thought, and I was just thinking as you, we were talking that it's not to trivialize it. I'm, like, it's not, I'm not trying to trivialize these things when we talk about geology to do this playful stuff, because I was thinking that nature in what it does geologically is playful isn't it all the things that happen the intersliding of levels that we can learn about in geology is playful it's nature at play you know it's interesting you know people say because we take geologists uh, and we train them in the field and the management always says Look, you could do a lot cheaper just staying in the office you know don't take them to see the rocks and the thing that people always learn is about scale so what what that comment you said john is all about scale you know so go get a rock well you know how big is a rock you know a pebble or are you talking about a large rock you threw it for a dog and and i would i would say that john because uh, we can do this john has the most wonderful uh, poetry caption in the book and we have some wonderful um uh, captions there. so we have a poetry competition uh, so john john is great at drawing sketches and he shared quite a few of those in fact i've got a collection of john hegley sketches here and one day i might be able to sell some money maybe john 
but no, that's a nice idea to pair up. But of course, you're paired up with Bob Gatliff, who is uh, you know the past president yep. of Edinburgh Jolsock, and so you have a you have a you you know you have a geologist in your back pocket almost. I've got my partner. I always used to be last to get a partner. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll we'll do that. Um, it was and that's a very interesting idea that we partner up, and especially on on the walk. You know, rather than all walking like we do on a geological field trip with loads of people, we might just get everybody to go off one geologist, one poet, and come back with a few lines, a stanza, or something. Yes, uh, Angus has uh, posted uh, the, uh, the the website um, for the Earthlines, uh, on, and on that you can actually find how to buy this book. Uh, this book does exist. Uh, it is here. It weighs about a stone, as I've tested it. <laughs> uh, or is this a rock? You know, is this a stone or is this a rock? Uh, I mean, I'm very fascinated. It's a, ch a Chucky Shirley, Shirley, Patrick. Sorry? It's a Chucky, surely. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's perfectly round, almost, but it is natural. So man hasn't touched this, and yet it's almost beautiful, you know. So limestone weathers into beautiful round pebbles. There's a few people have hands up, Patrick. Um, I think we've got some comments coming in. I don't okay. know. Thank you for that. I don't, um, don't know what order they're in, but I'm sure they can just... Uh, I thought pick Mark. Uh, Mark, you want to say something? Sure. Okay. So uh, just just to say that I think poetry and and writing it's accessible to uh, people you know of all ages, all backgrounds. Uh, people love it. Uh, it's not for everybody, but um, you know um, it is. It's there for people if they if they want to do it. And I think the thing. Um, for the challenge for us is, you know, how do we get the resources to reach out to more people? Um, you know, we can we can maybe in, invite. If we could perhaps have, uh, you know, a, a um, members of societies who are more kind of, you know, interested in poetry and try to. You know, do a little bit of outreach on on, on that front. You know, um, but it really does come down to resources. How do you reach out to to schools, to non geological societies, to the public in general? And how, how do you do that? You know. Yeah, well, I think uh, through my, myself, through the Royal Society of Edinburgh, you know, I've often been going to schools and to talk about poetry and, and energy poetry in the broader sense, you know, uh, rather than climate change poetry, but to talk about the poetry of energy. Um, but, you know, getting take up of that, you can offer yourself to schools, but schools have to invite you in and schools have to create the environment. So it is quite difficult, uh, Mark. That's, that's a good point, uh, reaching out. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, moving along the top of my screen, Elizabeth. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess sort of going along with that, um, so sort of pairing of geologists and um, poets, and I think someone said earlier, like how how do you how do you get um, like people to do this um, and funding, but you know, um, like creating some sort of introductory introduction to poetry workshops specifically around a geological team. Um, I've been attending, you know, the courses, uh, the talks on um, in the Scottish Geology Festival. I think it's amazing. I don't really know that much, Scot uh, you know, geology about Scotland, and, it, and it's really very interesting. And you know, following on from that, you could have a little session um, where where you do, you know, someone facilitates, um, you know, a workshop about, you know, how do we get like inspiration from. Um, like the stories that you have heard into into poetry and stuff, you know, brainstorm and, you know, a very um, introductory level. So, uh, you know, my suggestion would be um, introduction to, you know, a very intro level course to poetry. Are you volunteering, Elizabeth? That's what <laughs> I, I have thought about this before. For so, um, but I, I never facilitated a workshop. But yeah, it you know I I think a lot of people want to try. Like it, it, it interests a lot of people. But I it's, agree. Poetry is just... somewhere a bit daunting, you know, when when it doesn't have to be. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, Brian, well, you know, remembers poetry at school, which was remembering vast tragedies of text, and and you know, it's a memory exercise, and 
where, whereas, you know, like, like uh, John was saying, it's really about crafting for some words, you know, and I think just getting words down on the page and then seeing how they flow is, is, is the way I start with things. It's like a fan poem always, you know, you've got a list of things and you put them down. So John, you were next, and then after that, Rob. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of responding to a question that Helen put, Helen Bowden put in chat, chat earlier about what, what was I going to say at the end of the discussion period. And I guess I was responding to um, Brian's statement about, in a sense, in the educational establishment, STEM being in and arts being out. And, you know, I'm not sure about in-groups and out-groups. My own experience when I was, well, several times a student, um, you would see scientists um, and mathematicians reading the English literature and philosophy and politics and history stacks, but you almost never saw arts, <laughs> arts-based students reading the stats or the, the physics uh, chat, uh, stacks. So there's a literacy thing that I think says um, that in a sense it's more important to engage poets with the science than actually necessarily sciences, scientists with the, with the poetry. And that's not to say that um, because we can all speak, well, because we all speak a language, and in our case, mostly English, um, that anybody can write something that is undoubtedly craft involved. But the barriers to this kind of interdisciplinarity stuff, I think, are greater from arts to science than from science to arts. Um, I guess just relating to something that was said earlier as well, um, one of my current projects is, is, a, is a deep, a very, it's going to be a very long poem, a deep time um, exploration of the Deverin water catchment, because I've kind of come to a conclusion that water catchments are what they're all about. Um, plank time is a real challenge, especially in Scots, um, but it, it puts us up against the problem about how you write poetry and keep interest if you don't have a protagonist, if you only have process. Um, and I think that's one of the big challenges for geopoetry is, you know, how do you write a poem for where for 600 million years nothing much happens? So, so the 600 million years between recombination and ionization in just after the Big Bang literally is 600 million years where nothing happens. There's no light. There's no ionization. We're waiting for the spark to happen. Um, and, and there's real, I think there's really interesting poetic craft challenges in there in how you relate to, to that kind of deep time um, you know, as Sarah referring to the Neolithic as as a big time scale, and I understand, and yes, it is, but it's <laughs> I guess four about again six point five billion. So there is, a, you know, there's there's lots, lots, lots of interesting stuff to learn on both sides here. I think. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I, I saw there's a comment from Kirsten who's just starting a PhD in this, and there's a a quote in the inside cover from Celia, Cecilia Reed, who's also a PhD student in this very area. So, you know, there are these uh, younger people coming through. It's a bit late for some of us to start PhD again, but, uh, you know, so, um, you know, people coming through interested in this. And I think this, you know, Cecilia makes a comment, this is a great place to start, a great reference book to start with, you know, so that's quite nice. Somebody can analyze it in great depth. Uh, so Rob. Can I just respond to a comment from Susan Barnard? I am absolutely not, never claiming that there are not, there's not enormous creat creativity in STEM disciplines. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's that it operates within a more rigorous framework, disciplinary framework. Ecologists but, are in STEM, I think, and we, are, yeah. we have to create things all the time, you know, because yeah. you can't read the rocks without creating. So, and, and we love nothing better than sketching, you know, it's G101 is draw a sketch. So I'm in no sense claiming that they're not enormously creative disciplines. Yeah. And in fact, uh, uh, Dick Selly was one of the one of the most well-known geologists when I was young. You know, he's got his field notebook in the book with some lovely sketches um, and a poem in, in which was also in you know, geologists singing at night around a campfire, making up poetry and singing. So geologists are full of imagination. So Rob, uh, your point. Yeah, uh, well, two really on the back of what John just said about the the kind of difference between uh, connecting the arts with the sciences and the sciences back to the arts. Um, I agree, really. I think in my experience, there does seem to be a, a kind of a, a postmodernist scepticism 
from the arts and humanities towards what might be seen as a kind of essentialist uh, sciences. Um, so that might be one of the kind of stumbling blocks. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to say really was to, to kind of bring it back to these ideas of collaboration and the kind of speed dating and whatnot. It all sounds really, really great fun. And, and I think we all agree that it's how useful it would be. But um, it, it also comes with a kind of geopoetic pedigree as well, because it's very much in keeping with the Canadian poet Don McKay and his ideas of uh, forging a crossing point between uh, the, the great amazing facts that, that scientific uh, observations can, can lead us down with the sort of more uh, tricky to trace, mystical and, and uh, poetic vision. Um, and likewise, in a kind of formal sense, the, the poet and, and geologist Professor uh, Tim Creswell um, wrote a recent essay on geopoetics in, in, in relation to hybrid forms and, and kind of thinking about poetic essays and essays that uh, use geological language and whatnot. So, you know, this is, you know, we, we've, got, we've got a lot of armour here. Is, uh, and a lot of a lot of gun power behind this, I think. Well, my copy of, 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 of the book has got this proof copy, so proof that it exists. So I'll tell everybody. But, uh, your copy will not have a folding cover like this. You also have a nice cover, thanks to Sarah's observations on the on the on the, uh, the proof copy. So now that that all sounds that all sounds great and. The comment that Mark made about how accessible, I think Helen Natras has got this well-being group where they talk about geological poetry and how that's quite important for them. So, you know, there's also this well-being stuff that we're into these days worrying about people. So I think I think there's a role there also of the geopoetry. Of course, what I discovered in in the geopoetry was first, you know, back in the 1950s and it was basically uh, Hess uh, talking about plate tectonics in the days before they had the evidence. And he basically made up the story that the, you know, South America had moved apart from Africa with no data to support it. And so, so via poetry is what my geophysicists say, is geology don't have any data, they just make it up, you know. So uh, that, that's basically, it's quite often thrown at geologists as a bit of a rude word. You know, you guys, you just make it up. And of course we do. And, you know, two stories, three stories, you know, we do. But, but Patrick, don't forget about Arthur Holmes. I will never forget that. His big red book is sitting up there propping up my bookcase. So um... I, I have mine too, but he's basically been sidelined, partly because of the fact that he published in a, quote, obscure journal. But that, that's another story, I think. Mm. Yeah. OK, Brian. Um, on that note, uh, we're going to, uh, I have the role of sort of this but, but but could I make a... Yeah, please do, Norman. Yeah, I, I just think it would be, it would be very good if the editors and any other folk who are here tonight uh, could get together and discuss, uh, well, and once the books are out, I'm thinking, in a, you know, in a few weeks time or whenever, could, could talk about how how to take this forward. I think it's been a really important development and it might be, for example, Scottish Centre for Geopoetics usually has a conference. Usually it began with a two day and then it became a three day conference because there were so many proposals for papers and workshops. Uh, so we, we were possibly thinking about a conference next year in a place that has some geological significance perhaps where we can get a decent big hall where we did in Seal, or the Slate Island. Um, so I think it would be useful to discuss how to take it forward. There's a lot of great ideas come up tonight. And I think- well, we're, we're, we're open for emails, the, the editors, that people can- yeah. and, and Norman, I'm coming to, to visit Lung in, in the end of this month. So we can start the conversation there. And, and the right. book, they, they, we told that they will be with us on Tuesday next week. So by the end of- Brilliant. Couple yeah. of weeks, everybody will have their copies, and all of the contributors will have a copy. And I hope everybody else here will will purchase a copy. It's extremely good value because all of the work uh, and my closing comments are really just to thank uh, everybody because 
you know, all of these people have put in time and effort here for zero uh, payback, you know, so this yeah. is this is a voluntary thing. Uh, the, 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 the benefit, if, if we do make a surplus, will go to uh, charities, including the Scottish Poetry Library, the Scottish Centre of Geopolitics, and uh, the Edinburgh Geological uh, Society. My job is to make sure we don't lose money on this project. Well, I have some anger we have that job. But okay. all those people are the people that I need to thank. Um, and, you know, there's a few more. I couldn't get them all on one slide. I couldn't even get everybody on one slide. And, and clearly here, I, I can pick up uh, Sarah because Sarah uh, single-handedly has, has kept, kept the editorial process uh, rolling forward and every single full stop in that book has been changed. <laughs> and I have had to learn about N rules and N rules and ellipses. Uh, I thought ellipse, you know, that's what that's an ellipse, but you haven't heard the ellipse. Um, and you know, this has been our uh, copy editor and, and she works with the BGS. So she's done this, uh, you know, uh, mostly on a voluntary basis. Angus, you know, has been a star. And that photograph, Mike Rimpet, uh, I mean, that trilobite, that almost a lovely bug, um, that trilobite, that took three different iterations to get that photograph in the book, you know. So that is the most photographed trilobite I've ever seen. <laughs> so you can buy a copy, you can email us, and uh, I think from there I'm going to uh, say goodbye by going back to the uh, web, uh, well, to, to the, the, the music uh, of uh, Govan Hill Moonshine, uh, Paco Schwedger's uh, Dave uh, uh, Dave is uh, um, Dave Banks uh, is one of them, is, is a geologist um, and, and inside that geologist is a very creative uh, partner in a, in a I think the uh, the uh, musician rather than the singer is the geologist um, so don't worry about that uh, I don't worry about that uh, we're going to play this and we're going to play out on this so you can just log off listening to this lovely music and I will go through the words. The words are on the um, web. Down about Berkeley Town, under the sign of a swan, lives a gentle poor woman by the name of Alice Molly. From noon till late at night, by day and by lantern light, grass of ale and scrum to bite from the hand of Alice Marley. As the swan does love the water clear, and man does love good ale and beer, all did love this woman dear, the lovely Elsie Marley. Alison was a handsome sight Till the roving Dutch passed by to fight And to subdue the Jacobite And shot the swan to pieces But Ralph and Elsie respect no fate They kept the swan worth of children eight Till the year of 1768 When Elsie Marley sickened As the swan does love the water clean that flows from the fells and the tyne and the weir As man does love the amber beer All loved Elsie Molly I tell the news and tell it plain She's been found dead down by Vigo Lane She's in a coal pit fallen down into the ochre water I tell the news to Geordie and Jane The fearful news from Vigo Lane Elsie Marley, she is slain Drowned in the ochre water As the swan does love the water clear That fills the pits down by the weir As man does love the ochre beer All loved Elsie Marley Now Elsie drinks the blood red water For the coal has taken Harrison's daughter Drink poke rail and cold black porter And a toast to Elsie Marley From Baker Hill to Walker's Shore Where 
Call your lads forevermore We'll dance a jig, we'll rant and roar To the tune of Elsie Marley From Biker Hill to Walker Shore We'll call your lads forevermore We'll dance a jig, we'll rant and roar To the tune of Elsie Marley From Biker Hill to Walker Shore We'll call your lads forevermore We'll Dance a jig, we'll rant and roar to the tune of Elsie Marley. To the tune of Elsie Marley. To the tune. 